Hey, Ricky, you know what's awesome? What's that, Billy? Your favorite records. My favorite records? Our favorite, everybody's favorite records. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So this could have th this podcast could have gone in a couple of different directions. It could have been just talking straight up about music or horror movies. Um, <laughs> we, we, we both have horror movie podcasts that we've done. So that's why this podcast was born. But then we started talking because we both have a, just a love of music. And we both have a love of 80s heavy metal, but also heavy metal in general from the 60s 70s 80s also just music music in general yeah like i i find myself um flipping between you know i thought it was the weirdest thing earlier it, it was like i i had a a bach or beethoven instrumental by by a flamenco guitar player playing this the suite on his guitar and then the song ended and it was megadeth and then i <laughs> i fast forwarded through that and it was nirvana and it just kind of like all of these things are things that i love because music just right. just just an overly strummed e not no not chord just just an e note yeah can hit emotions and it can it can trigger memories it can just make you feel at home and then then you think about it and you're like man where have i been this whole time that i wasn't paying attention to this just one easily strummed note but then you have your your favorite songs you have your favorite records you have m musicians who may or may not have actually played on your favorite records it's it's interesting how that works yeah. but uh I think every time we get together and talk about anything, it always either comes back to horror movies or it comes back to music. And so yeah. as we're as we're kind of wrapping up the show, it's a good time to talk about music again because yeah. it's, it's it's my favorite thing. So <laughs> <laughs> so, so do we do we start with like when we were like little kids kind of first influences up to you know complete albums kind of thing uh, dude i've always been an album rocker that, yeah. that was my thing is me too. It, it is it it bugs me in this kind of well it's even past because now with streaming you just get a song you don't get a record or an artist but even yeah. back in like the I, iTunes days where you'd buy a song by an artist, it's, it's, it's my default to just buy the record because obviously if they were good enough to write this good song, then they should have been able to be good enough to write a record. And um, that used to drive me insane because I remember this guy at school, which I don't know if he's going to be listening to this or not, but he was trying to fit into that mode of, hey, man, I got that new Judas Priest record. I'm like, well, all right, well, cool. What would what, you think about it? Well, I don't know. I've just listened to that one song over and over and over. That's the popular one. I'm like, dude, if you like one song, <laughs> right. you're probably going to like another. You know, uh, For me, the albums have always been, you're catching a band at a, in a moment in time. You know, you can go go through catalogs of bands, look at their anthologies, and you can see when they were young and starving, really trying to make an impact to, after they've made it, they, they've kind of gotten bloated and the songs are just a little more, yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that's what you're buying. You're not just buying a song, you're buying a, a moment in time of your favorite artist. I, man... I totally agree. That's that's it, <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that one of my favorite records and it's going to we're going to talk about it is a compilation record. Sure. Um but but no, you you you're absolutely right and that's that that was I was an album rock guy. Mm -hmm. I think that was my dad. My dad was a a, a DJ and he said that, you know, the a, the the representative would come in and he'd drop a bunch of records and they'd be 12 inch or seven inch singles 
you know, 12 inch record, you know, LPs yeah. or EPs and be like, okay, here's all of this stuff that you need to look through and figure out what's going to be on your playlist. And um, it's kind of an interesting look into the way radio is and or was because it was a whole lot more analog and a whole lot more hands-on because mm -hmm. the program managers actually had the choices what they were going to play as opposed to just having it emailed <laughs> you know right. like right now yeah. you get a just conglomerate it's just like boom you know a hundred million stations are going to play the same 10 songs dad would get these uh stacks of records and a list of, of artists and he'd put them on and he said then he because he was a music lover too he he was he was big into music and but he'd be like, man, I had about 30 seconds. If you didn't grab me in 30 seconds, I had to toss it and throw a new record on because I had so many records to go through. And this was a job. It wasn't a an audio file. So right. he said that that he, he regretted it later. But like when I was a teenager and I was all big into Pink Floyd, he's like, man, I had right. so many Pink Floyd songs, like records come over and everybody was like, oh, Pink Floyd's you know, awesome. He's like, I only had about 30 seconds and in 30 seconds, Pink Floyd hasn't <laughs> even like yeah. slowed, like played a note. He's <laughs> like, so I was never into Pink Floyd. Like it just didn't, didn't, didn't yeah. play. Um, I remember being a kid and I've mentioned it on the show probably in the past, but you know, like in the eighties when all of us, Oliver Stone started trying to push the doors back up mm -hmm. out of the 60s. Um, yeah. My dad was like, dude, if you really want to have a scale, he's like, the doors were probably almost big enough to open for Jimi Hendrix. Like they would have been a third stage band. It, even as big as the doors were, Jimi Hendrix was just like, oh, yeah stratospheric but sure but in the 60s they the 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 record companies kind of negotiated for space so they're like okay we've got a we've got a triple bill we got we got our 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 hot hot artist and our up-and-coming artist and we're gonna roll dice before each show to see who plays first because it was just yep. a a, a crapshoot so yeah Mutant. It was also there was that, and there was also whatever area you were playing in. If you had three popular acts, whoever was the biggest draw in that area or had the most success would be your headliner, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just listened to a thing about we'll talk about this band in a little bit, but he was saying that there was a, a time in the seventies when they, they were put together with two other big acts, and they were playing arenas. He said none of us could do an arena at that time by ourselves. He said, but the three together, which, you know, we see these a lot now with the 80s acts doing their hair show and two or three bands get together and they sell a lot of tickets, but they did it by themselves. Probably wouldn't have as big of a crowd. So mm -hmm. it's that same mentality, but based off of sales of their individual albums, determine who was going to be the headliner in that arena that night. In that, in that particular spot. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. But man... At the end of the day, it, it's it's really about chords, lyrics, solos. Yeah. I mean, the the stuff that just this the stuff that made you get goosebumps, the stuff that made you bristle, the stuff that just made you wake up and look around and be like, "This is a damn good song." So yeah. we got we got kind of our top five records. Again, I didn't even make a list. The funny top thing five. is, <laughs> top five. Dang. Oh well, we said we said top <laughs> records. I figured we'd, we'd go through. Not, I mean, kind of everybody. Anybody who knows me knows who my favorite everything is. But, yeah. but, I mean, I'll, I'll try to play along. <laughs> I don't know if I can name my top five, but we'll see. Yeah, top five is hard. Top five, yeah. top top everything is hard. I mean. It, this can't be one of those VH1 countdowns either, because right. I mean, <laughs> number two hundred forty-two is. <laughs> but it's kind of again one of those one of those things that just makes you makes you feel like 
it, it makes you feel alive. Like I know, yeah. I know in 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 current years because a lot has been revealed about him and the way the band was created and run. But like Bon Jovi, right? Sure. When I was in seventh grade, "Slippery When Wet" was like the number one record of all time. It was the oh, yeah. biggest thing in the world. Yep. And as as a little aside. My, my music loving father was like, I don't like them. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, he's like, dude, I've had iron butterfly in the back seat of my car. <laughs> like, These guys suck. But I was, I was a kid. You know what you're going to do? You know, it's, yeah. it's the biggest thing ever. But um, it, it's funny you say that because my dad, it, I think it's just a parent thing, right? You kind of give your kids crap about the bands they listen to because, you know, big Queen fan. He's like, man, you figured all that money, he'd go get his teeth fixed. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he'd say things like that or, you know, uh, docking the video for In My Dreams. It's all, it's raining on him and stuff. He's like, man, he said, look at these idiots. He said, they don't know to get out of the rain. <laughs> you know, they're going to ruin their instruments, you know, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, parents were ruthless in the 80s generation. <laughs> in my day, we had to slow down records to learn how to play songs. Like, how did you do that? Just like, we flipped a switch and like right. sat there with our guitars and tried to figure out the chords. I mean, that, that was the fun thing was he, he was never like, <laughs> he was very much like me. He was like, man, this sucks. Let me show you something that's, <laughs> that doesn't suck. Doesn't suck. <laughs> you know? um, that, that was always hit me whenever, like, it's funny because on Columbia House or whatever, like, I got a handful of records and one of them was Winger. And Winger had a cover of Purple Haze, I think. Yep. It was Purple Haze. Yep. And he's like, right. what yeah. the hell is this? No, right. no, <laughs> like, <laughs> record scratch <laughs> like, experience on the record. Like, let's let's listen to some. But I was probably like eleven. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't. I mean, you can't trade these memories for things. And I'm right. trying. I'm trying with my daughters. I'm trying with my daughters to be like, this is good music. What what's what's somehow internet famous because somebody danced to it. Not nothing, nah, dude. Yeah, let's let's well, play. But you gotta remember, usually in most cases, if your parents don't like it, then it's cool, right? It's, prob it's probably good, <laughs> but yeah, not not on the top five, but definitely in a influential, slippery and wet. Sure, um, I mean, it's a good record. in Like, it's objectively good, like, you you listen to it. It's got a lot of good songs on there. Yeah. It's not a favorite. My <laughs> like I don't it's it's hard because right. I've got I've got other I've got other records that are, are not as good as this one, but make me feel more musically right. happy. So, yeah. but but I have to mention it because it was one of those it, where it was influ influential, right? I mean, that's it, that's what I mean. That's why it's hard to separate the stuff because I could sit here and say one of my favorite CDs, even now, to listen to is Abba's Greatest Hits. I can throw Abba on and I love it. I mean, I just I do. <laughs> now it didn't make me want to be a musician when I heard Abba, <laughs> but I, I just I'm amazed at the quality of just the sound right those two girls singing in unison being able to split off the i mean there's some amazing production on there so to me i categorize things like you said it's based off feel but it's also everything's kind of got its slot right mm -hmm. there's a reason there's a reason you can like the ramones and tom jones <laughs> you know well, and, and to and be I'm, fair, to be fair, the the Ramones and Tom Jones are both kind of playing in that same sort of. I mean, their their styles yeah. are different, but they're playing in that same sort of wavelength. I guess is the is the word. Yeah. Like, 
you you can you can punkify Tom Jones and it would still sound like a Tom Jones song. Yeah, it's so, just nothing drives me more insane than people that only listen to this and everything else outside of this is not worth listening to. It's all relative, dude. All mm-hmm. music came from the same source. If you go back to the beginnings, it's just different things are for different emotions. I'm, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Yeah. The, uh, which I'll tell anybody who's listening, who like deep cuts. I picked up a handful of records the other day at Goodwill, and I picked up a, a CD of the Drifters' greatest hits. Yeah. Oh, man. Like the drifters. Oh, I know all of these songs. Dude, <laughs> those guys had more hits than most of the bands that I've ever listened to. Yeah. And they're good. Like they're good songs. Most of them have been covered. Most of them have been sure. used in song, you know, soundtracks for movies. If these guys aren't freaking loaded, I don't, I don't know what to say because yeah. it's, it's, but yeah, those guys are not the coasters, the drifters. Yeah. They're the man. But uh, yeah, back to records. I mean, I don't know. I mentioned Bon Jovi. What's your sure. what? What's your kind of next hit? Um. Uh, well, it's it's going to be through different things, right? I mean, obviously, I've got to talk about you know, huge Kiss fan. I'll always go back to Destroyer. Uh, to me, that's just kind of the mainstay. It's, you know, <laughs> every song on it is iconic. You're talking about, you know, your dad with the, the DJ and thing. And even think about how big a song Detroit Rock City is. It was released as a, as a single. And they threw Beth on the backside of it because they thought it was a throwaway song. They sent it out to the, D, the DJ stations, the radio stations to play it. Well, they started playing Beth instead, and that's how that song even happened as far because they were not going to release it as a single and basically becomes their biggest song, but both of those songs come off the same album. You you take a ragtag bunch of 22-year-old kids who have just hit you know, a multi-platinum status with their live album, and they're stepping back in the studio with Bob Ezra. <laughs> which I'll talk about Bob Ezrin here in a minute too. But So the genius, the, the, the magician of the studio is now producing a Kiss album. And I don't know, man. I just, I love everything about that album. Uh, it was, it, that's when I knew I was a diehard fan when, when <laughs> that album came out and it just, it just blew me away. And uh, it's still my favorite album of, of theirs any day. I mean, can't beat it. Shout it out loud. God of Thunder. King of the Nighttime World. Detroit Rock City. Uh, uh, do you a, love me? Yeah. It, I mean, it's a great record. It is funny, though, because in my opinion, Beth is probably one of their favorite, like one of my favorite yeah, Kiss songs sure. ever. Yeah. I go, it's a throwaway song. Well, of course, because it doesn't it doesn't fit your brand. Right. Like you're a whole bunch of cosmic weirdos from outer space and you're like <laughs> oh well, i'm singing this little love song to my girlfriend back at the house yep but it does kind of hit because if you're me or if you're you we've all had the beth conversation sure we've all had that like hey babe like i i you know like i i i, I yep. understand I'm late. I said I'd be home at nine. It's nine thirty-four. <laughs> I know you're pissed. I, don't think I, I don't love you. <laughs> I know you're mad, but I'm on my way as soon as like you know. <laughs> in the old cover band, it was we weren't even working towards like Kiss Stratosphere, but like Juliet was a, an infant, and like in our practice space, we were in a neighborhood, and we had to shut down by nine. So we're done by nine. Like practice is over at nine. And like nine twenty, angry wife texts me. I'm like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> like the fact that we're done, like we can't play instruments at nine does not mean we're I mean, done you can't hopping. hang out. Right. But that that's Beth right there. 
<laughs> every dude who's ever played a guitar feels that song. For, oh, yeah. for that to be a throwaway song, they're like, ah, <laughs> like we have to be. Yeah. We have to be killer. No, you don't. You just have to tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. And again, Bob Ezrin made that happen. I mean, they were they were not going to put that song in there, and he went and did all the arrangement, even played the piano on it. And it, it became what it became. It was originally going to be called Beck. I don't know if you knew that or not. His wife's oh. name was was Rebecca, Becky. And they were like, yeah, I don't think you ought to call it Beck because people are going to think you're singing to Jeff Beck. And <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. All right. What you got? All right. I didn't, I didn't want to. Uh, I mean, I do have cool cred. But I, I know you're a fan of them. I think the awakening from somewhere between being like 10, 11 years old and realizing there's rock and roll, that that hit me with Def Leppard. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, we've talked about, I mean, Scott and I did an entire episode Actually, I think it turned into three episodes on how awesome 1987 was. Oh, yeah. Well, 1987, I was 12. Yeah. Okay. So that meant that, like, you know, Predator and Robocop and Appetite for Destruction and, like, all of these things were, like, dude, Def Leppard's Hysteria woke something up in me that has never been like it's only gotten bigger and it was hard whenever i was like in junior high later because i was in elementary school i was i was on the cusp of junior high and like elementary school and they're like oh def leppard's not cool anymore because you know whatever right and you you are correct <laughs> you're, you're correct def leppard is not cool in these certain scenarios Except for, man, that record is amazing. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's so one of the biggest selling rock albums of all time. And, and it's it's completely pointed at girls, but it's sure. also pointed at guys like me who were like twelve yeah. that just yeah. want a girlfriend. Like you didn't. You woke up one day and you were like, I was just playing GI Joes and and Army guys in the front yard with with my friends but now all of a sudden stephanie viloff is cute where, where did that right. come from like yeah. she's been here the whole time she's been here the whole time but then one yeah. day you're just like you know yeah that was and you get the story too of i mean we love to play music because it's the emotional thing but Gene Simmons always said it best. He said, that's fine. Great musical integrity. He said, the main reason you play is because of girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, bottom line. He said, as a kid growing up, he saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. He said, he kept hearing this noise sound like feedback. And he said, when they panned the camera and showed the crowd, it was the feedback was girls screaming at him. He mm -hmm. said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's, yeah, I, I'm in. So Def Leppard is still that same mentality, right? Because it's it's hard rock guys that you know you go man these these guys are good but you kind of hate them because all the girls think they're something too but at the same time you're like i want to be that guy that's why the girls like them right and it's kind of like brad pitt you try to hate brad pitt because the women <laughs> woo over him but then you see him act you're like yeah he's, i can't hate yeah, i can't hate a... this guy <laughs> well and it's funny because like def leppard it, it you know again going back to 12 year old me Def Leppard had previous albums before Hysteria oh, yeah. so they had uh, Pyromania and On Through the Night and and Dry oh yeah so they had like four albums <laughs> before Hysteria they had Pyro Hysteria, Pyromania yeah High and Dry and on yeah so but they like fooling and photograph and there's a lot of Def Leppard songs that are not on Hysteria 
that whenever you listen to Hysteria, and they've got Hysteria has goofy songs on it. Oh yeah, like, yeah. And like, and that's that's kind of my thing too because that's that album came out the year I graduated. It was the biggest album, no mm-hmm. no doubt. To this day, you play "Pour Some Sugar on Me," people are gonna dance. It's just of a fact. course. My personal favorite album of theirs is Pyromania because it was heavier. The I better mean, album. Rock of Ages, Photograph, Billy's Got a Gun, Action Not Worse. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. To me, that's just a better album. But because the production value goes through the roof on Hysteria, the songs are more catchy. They're more radio friendly, more girl friendly. And you got all the backstory of, well, now we got a drummer that doesn't have an arm that's playing drums. And I mean, so there was a lot to absorb in that package because there's a long wait for that yeah. next album. There, there's there's a lot of marketing into the band. Mm. And even even after Hysteria, then their other guitar player died. Yeah, Steve Clark, yeah. Steve Clark, um, which is... Again, one of the like those first tragedies where you're like, wait, what? Like, how did that happen? Um, he was really the heart and soul of the band. I mean, he, he was a really clever guitar player. Some of those parts he came up with were brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I just remember man being in a little league and not giving one half of a crap about whether we won or lost. All I wanted to do is go home. And put my little uh, Sony, yeah, headphones on and push play on Hysteria. Yeah, and I mean, it, again, it's got stupid songs on there. Like "Don't Shoot Shotgun" is not a good song, but <laughs> I mean, you know, Lang thought it was good, but right. <laughs> whatever, dude. Again, but you know, Pyromania was a much better record. And it's funny because, again, my, my old band member, my old bass player, he's like, Def Leppard sucks. I was like, go back and listen to the first record. Yeah. It's yeah. it's very bluesy, very amateur, but they were also like 16 years old. Yeah. yeah. And and he's like, I, I just can't do it. I was like, dude, I can listen to that all day because it's got mm-hmm. that, that Def Leppard sound to it. With a whole bunch of it, it sounds like one of those YouTube covers that you'd see where it's like, oh, we're playing Def Leppard, and it's like a whole bunch of kids playing it. It's like, yeah. oh wait, but that was them doing it. Goody, 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 got it, goody got it, Sam, goody got it, Sam, goody got it, Sam, goody, Sam, goody got it. We've got it. Summer savings at Sam Goody. Pick up Theater of Pain from Motley Crue, Invasion of Your Privacy, new from Rat, and Shaken and Stirred by Robert Plant. On sale now, only $6.99 each. Store-wide summer savings at Sam Goody. Goody, Goody, Sam Goody got it. Goody, Goody, Sam Goody got it. Sam Goody got it. Sam Goody. Yeah, I mean, it, got it's... It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the heyday is obviously hysteria, but I appreciate... Of course, I grew up with those albums. Mm-hmm. So... High and Dry and Pyromania to me are the ones I still go back and listen to the most. Hysteria, I'd kind of moved on to other things, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But but it couldn't you couldn't deny the fact of they were so big. You know, it's that thing where you say, wait a minute, the girls that are in my class that have always hated the music that I listen to are now listening to Def Leppard, so something's wrong. So, well, so, <laughs> something's up. Yeah. It might mean uh, something's wrong. Something's up. Something's right. going... Which, was, uh, I, have, his... I mean, still, I mean, I like the fact that, okay, you, you stopped listening to your Footloose soundtrack. Let's hear it for the boy. Now you've moved into Def <laughs> Leppard. Good choice. I'm happy for you, you know, but I have to check my credibility now mm. because you're listening to what I listen to. <laughs> right there with you, man. All right, what's your next what's your next shot? <laughs> I'm gonna throw you a curveball here. <clears throat> all right. Huge Queen fan. We all know that. But my favorite Queen album is Queen 2. Now, there's not a hit on it. It's uh before they even really were signed with the EMI. So everybody talks about a day at the races, right? That's that's the big or night at the opera and a day at the races. Those two albums are the pinnacles but 
there is something about Queen 2 that is, here's a band that's been in the studio. They made their first album. Second album is where they get so creative. There's still things on that album that I hear for the first time <laughs> when I go back and listen. They put so much stuff in those albums. I don't know if you, did you see the movie Bohemian Rhapsody? I did. So you know the scene where they're in the studio and they're swinging trash cans and uh -huh. that's Queen 2. There is so much stuff in there. There's some unreal harmony stuff going on that album that I've never heard anybody else ever pull off. And I don't know. It's, it's one of those albums that the more you dive into it, the more you find. It's almost the same thing of being like a Floyd fan or something like that, where you always kind of hear something a little different every time. So um, I, I have to admit, and this is, this is honestly, <laughs> it, it's, I was never a big Queen fan. Sure. Because. They kind of missed that window with you. Well, no, I, 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 I'm a big Queen fan now, but I'm only sure. picking it up. Yeah. Is that rock radio in the in the town that I live in is ninety percent ACDC and ten percent Led Zeppelin, right? And then every now and then they play "We Will Rock You." Yeah. But the 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 airwaves have a way of making you so freaking sick of anything that's on it. You're just like, you know what? <laughs> off my list off my list off my list yep, like I'm, I'm just like i can't stand it and yep. and it took me a while to kind of like kind of come back and be like oh well you know yeah they they can't be that famous for for this one song like there's no a and r guy that's like okay yeah there's one so i've i've mellowed myself and kind of gone back and like, dude, I'm I'm listening right now to like Billy Joel and Neil Diamond and stuff. They're like, sure, yeah, okay. Uh, I was in my heavy metal, uh, Dave Mustaine wannabe <laughs> sort of life. Th this was nerd rock, but here I am. So show me, and I'm I'm being amazed. And Queen is one of those bands. It's just like, like yeah, you said, yeah. Yeah. there there's a headspace in there that's just beyond yep. queen yeah, and the, it, queen and the doors are kind of like opposite ends of a spectrum and that queen right. is kind of light side and doors are dark side and they're but there there's a lot i have to learn about queen now <laughs> because i mean you go back to the third album which is sheer heart attack and <laughs> Metallica covered Stone Cold Crazy, mm -hmm. which is a Queen song. So it is credited to Queen to create the first speed metal song because it's 1973, 74, and this song comes out that is just unlike anything you've ever heard. And the, uh, I always tell people about that. It's like when you buy a Queen album, you don't know what you're buying, and it can vary from album to album. All you know is it's going to be good. And you're going to wake away going, holy crap. Mm. They really had the, the ability to say, here's our two or three radio friendly songs. And the rest of the album is ours, <laughs> you know, and the contrast just in an album was amazing. And I think that's why I like Queen 2 and News of the World are probably be two of my favorite. I mean, I can't deny A Night at the Opera. I mean, it's just it's it's a masterpiece. But there's something about those. That again, you're you're purchasing a moment in time in the band. Here's a band that was so ambitious when they made Queen 2. It had a black side and a white side of the album. <laughs> and it's a it's a concept album. But it doesn't play like a concept album. It plays like you're just hearing songs, but they do kind of bleed into each other. And it's just it's just freaking amazing, man. And you know, to this day, I'm still amazed that I can go the next album and it sounds nothing like the last album. Totally different set of songs. This song sounds like it's a little bit of ragtime in there. It's just like, you know, <laughs> it's it's mind blowing. But anyways, Queen no. Two. If you if you folks have never listened to Queen Two, I can't recommend it enough. 
Roger Waters said it's his favorite album of all time. I rest my case. <laughs> That's one of those that it's we're gonna move on to the next record. I mean, in, in that top five sort of thing. And I, this is this is a band sort of thing. Like, I, I have a friend of mine who's so into Pink Floyd that he doesn't listen to anything but Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah. I've known this dude for like 35 years. And you're <laughs> like, hey, man, have you heard Garth Brooks? He's like, oh, man, nah, but check out this Dave Gilmore solo. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> it's weird. But um, I, I do have to say, like, it, it, this was supposed to be a top five records or you know fav, yeah. fav, favorite records and it's not that anymore <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but there, there are certain certain bands certain records certain soundscapes pink floyd was always one of those that never hit me it was pink floyd was weird like learning how to play pink floyd on the guitar which is probably there's going to be people out there to be like i don't know what you're even talking about it was easy it was just like 979 979 for me deconstructing pink floyd was kind of trying to look into a magic book because while i could you know pick and touch the strings in a, you know, note for note sort of way, it didn't sound like that. Yeah. And he, and, and even David Gilmore says it in a couple of YouTube videos. He's like, well, it doesn't sound the way it needs to sound whenever you're playing it live in front of the uh, giant stack of speakers to where you can like lean back and rest on the sound. Right. <laughs> because he's like, you know, if you're like if you're if you're playing it through the guitar and it's holding you up because that's what the, the sound effects yeah. are doing. But the wall, certain certain songs on Man. there, like yeah. Comfortably Numb is one of them that's that's just I learned man, I, I learned it how to play it, sing it play it and sing it at the same time yep. play the solo forgot the solo because i was playing it and singing it at the same time like but then i hear it and i'm always amazed like i know this song into the depths of it yep but i'm always amazed at how amazing that song is and um, it's really yeah. not that complicated it's not that it's not that big of a deal it's just a handful of chords but it's but the it's, feel. It's, it's the it's feel, amazing. man. Amazing. Yep. And you know who produced that album? That's right, Bob Ezrin. The same guy that did Destroyer <laughs> for Kiss. It's a great record. Yeah. It's one of, the, <laughs> it's... one of the greatest albums ever made, hands down. One of the greatest albums ever made. And, and that album, or the movie, actually helped me through a difficult time. Man, the, the Wall became my anthem for quite a while. I was in a bad state. And that movie and, and the soundtrack or the actual album really helped me through a difficult time, man. And that's the power of music, right? And I've never liked Pink Floyd up to that point. It's just mm. not the same thing. Ah, oh, it's weird. It's it's dope smoking music. Uh, and a lot of it is. <laughs> but what he's talking about in the wall is so personal. And everybody deals with it mm -hmm. you just don't understand it i remember watching the movie <clears throat> my wife was in college all of her friends all they all lived together in this big house and the wall was on and of course i've never had drink alcohol never did any drugs and i'm watching the wall and everything in it makes sense to me and i'm stopping the tape and going do y'all know do you know what these worms mean <laughs> and they're just going oh boy he's lost it <laughs> But 
it all came together right there at that point of of what the message is in that in that in that album and i've never forgot it that that's how powerful of an album it is and i'm still just blown away by it and again the production it's bob ezrin <laughs> everything he does sounds like the band is playing on a mountaintop <laughs> you know yeah. It's, when I think of his production, it is it is about as big as you can get. It 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 is amazing that again Dave Gilmore himself is just like, well, you know, how, how do you get that sound? He's like, well, I do this and this, and then I hit the chords, and then I lean back, and then it just hold, <laughs> holds me up. <laughs> and he's this is old dave gilmore this is not right. stone like 60s gilmore he's this is 1980 yeah david gilmore he's like uh, you know but yeah to have something to say and to be able to say it that well is yeah. it's a gift yeah. um but yeah yeah i mean he, as as weird of a person as Roger Waters is, and as hard as he is to get along with, I mean, basically, this is the story of Sid Barrett. I mean, when when you look at the wall, this this kind of that breakdown of what was going on. Probably some other Roger Waters stories as well. What was going on in his life, but it just it's astonishing when you actually understand what you're listening to. It, it's just I, I I've never heard another concept album that is so personal mm -hmm. it's yeah it's pretty phenomenal yeah so past the wall back to you back to me ping pong <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm gonna go with you we talked about 1987 and i just commented on a hair band Facebook site. It's the anniversary of uh, Electric by the Cult. Okay. It is by far a top 10 album, my man. I, I never was a big fan of them before. I did like Seashell Sanctuary, you know, had that cool little kind of guitar thing. But I heard the, the opening riffs to, you know, Peace Dog, Wildflower, all the songs on that, and I was just absolutely blown away. This is this album just punches you in the face and never stops. It is just three chord, dries a bone, crack you in the face, rock and roll. I mean, and it's Rick Rubin, you know. Of course. Yeah, and so which some, somebody somebody just said, "Hey, play a fourth chord," and he's like, "Nah, go like take that one out." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he, he was doing Beastie Boys and all this stuff, and, and he was intermingling different musicians on, you know, doing the sound bites for those, all the solos for Beastie Boys. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, Billy Duffy, the guitar player in the cult, was playing the lead on some of those Beastie Boys songs. You know, mm -hmm. that's him. And that led to, you know, doing the cult album or vice versa. But Anyways, the electric to me, all killer, no filler. Every song is just, it, it's like American History X. It puts your face down that concrete block and just stomps on it. It's stomping your face. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's not heavy. It's just energetic, no bullcrap rock and roll. And I just, I love it for that. I mean, that's, that's awesome because <laughs> what I was going to hit you back with was completely not that. <laughs> their drums bang with vengeance. Their voices scream with power. Their guitars shatter your senses. Metal maniacs, your albums arrive. Masters of Metal with Rush, Dawkins, Van Halen, and Kiss. Rainbow, Crocus, and Hard Rockin' Iron Maiden. Masters of for more at a store near you. I don't know if it was just my age and where I was at the time or 
I, I'm pretty sure it was, but it was also just kind of a 90s dynamic. But the Downward Spiral by Nine Inch oh, yeah. Nails. Sure. A buddy of mine had the CD. <laughs> this is good old what's awesome because you can't just like download it and you can't put a tape like there was a CD and you had a CD in your backpack, a CD player in your backpack and it skipped or whatever. But man, he, he gave it to me and it sucked. I'm like, I didn't like it because it just had too many weird sounds and I couldn't yeah. tell if the CD was skipping or if <laughs> I, like right. I, I, I was, I was kind of, I was like, ah. And he's like, bro, <laughs> listen to it. Yeah. Just listen to the songs. And then there was something inside of it. There, there's layers. Oh yeah. That, that, al- that album is built on layers. Yep. There, there was something that like after, after the whole, you know, day at work, listening to it on the CD player, like whatever. I didn't want to listen to anything else. There was little parts and pieces. There was just something in there that was, that was real. It was authentic and it was just, it was awesome. It was amazing. There was, there there was no going back from this and that's, you know, downward spiral and, you know, so you've got your, your, Dude, you're circling the drain. There's something right in there that you have to hold on to. Maybe you're right. going down the drain yourself, but it's important. Man, that record is so good. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he was never able to yeah. recapture that lightning. Yeah. Everything yeah. after that sucks. Yeah, it's just it's it's where it all came together man and you know Reznor's all about those layers like you said every you know every every eighth bar it's going to keep building and building mm-hmm. and, build, and that's what he does it, it never backs back down it just keeps building uh first thing i heard was head like a hole from them and i was mm-hmm. like oh wait a minute <laughs> i gotta check this out and yeah i mean downward spiral yeah it's it's it was the next phase of where music was going right mm-hmm. it's weird it, that it almost it, i guess it's the uh, it's the, the equivalent of what everybody thought of like emerson lake and palmer when they came out right because that was supposed to be the next you know bing, all, bing. music's just heading this way and this is the way all music's going to be and we really believed that's what was happening with 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 nine inch nails and, and they just carved out their own little niche there and and it is what it is. What's weird is he handed off the football to Marilyn Manson. Like I don't mean he, I don't I don't think he meant to do it, but yeah. that's what happened. Sure. And um it's it, it, it's it's weird, you know, you're you're older than me and I'm older than a lot of the people maybe listening to the show is but Marilyn Manson okay. Spoiler alert, Marilyn Manson has been canceled by mainstream media and everything. No, Marilyn yeah. Manson was never that cool, and he wasn't always that good. He was just yeah. produced by Trent Reznor, who was trying to figure out his next place, right? But the Downward Spiral, as a record, oh, yeah. was it's amazing. You you can't touch it. It's 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 yeah. untouchable. There's there's things that have come after. There there is a certain sense of desperation, but there's nothing that hits as hard as that record probably will ever hit. Yeah. And I mean, I <laughs> I was 22 years old waiting for the bus stop with my discman in the back yeah. of my backpack. And hearing like some, 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 you're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you see, there's just this certain 
thing. My dad's like, oh, I was listening to the Beach Boys. So I'm like, guess what? I was not. <laughs> uh, I know, man. It was like, this show's running long, but it's okay. That's hey, good. I've got a, uh, a twofer for you right here. Because I can't decide which one's more important to me. But uh, that would be Twisted Sisters Stay Hungry and Dawkins Tooth and Nail. Stay which one Hungry. Are you... Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, which one are you learning how to play the guitar to? I'm trying Tooth and Nail. <laughs> well, then that one's more important. <laughs> But there's something about Stay Hungry. I mean, I, I'm not really a fan of the other Twisted Sister stuff. I do like Come Out and Play, but the other albums I never cared for. Stay Hungry was that lightning in the bottle thing for me, man. And it's funny is every year we come to Texas, to, to Texas Frightmare, me, Danny, and then my other buddy, Shannon, that comes up, all three of us in past life didn't even know each other. We are all diehard fans of that album, and we sing every word to every song on Stay Hungry. We, we will <laughs> pop it in, drive to Texas, and we're listening to Stay Hungry and singing every song on there. And it's like, wow. You know, Danny's lived in Nashville his whole life. Shannon, I never even met. He became my boss just, you know, five or six years ago. <laughs> never met the guy. And we know every word on that album. And it's like, wow <laughs> you know so that that album to me is a definite period in my life man it's a i mean i i had kiss i had queen but it's like this is kind of my thing now right <laughs> then i heard docking <laughs> george lynch playing things on a guitar i mean i knew who eddie van halen was but I'd never heard anything as ferocious as what Lynch was doing on Tooth and Nail. I was just like, is that a guitar? Right. <laughs> you know, is that a guitar? Because, you know, so it's like you're just playing a guitar on, you, you You kept the music at the same speed and you just took the guitar and just sped it up. Sped it up, you know? yeah. And, yeah, uh, I love every song on Tooth and Nail. Ducking was one of my main bands for a while. And that's the year. This is 84 going in 85. That's when I realized I'm a metalhead. <laughs> These were the bands that did it. Twisted Sister and, and Dockin were the bands <laughs> that led to getting into Priest, getting into Maiden, all this stuff. I mean, which are more iconic bands for sure. But it started with these bands. And that was a real turning point for me musically because... I found my music, you know. <laughs> I, dude, I'm right there with you. Like, I found my music. Here's where I am. But it, it it's changed over time, like, my music, what it is. But um, I'm going to drop a commercial in here. I need to go take a leak. <laughs> <laughs> I'll okay. be right back.
All right, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's cer certain things about timelines. Dude, I've been on the phone with tech support all day. So they're <laughs> like, okay, we'll just hit this button. I'm like, man, <laughs> I hate to have to tell you this, but I got to take a break. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right. Commercial is over. We're back. All right, so I know which one you haven't talked about yet. <laughs> What's that? No, 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 no. I was I was looking at the list. I was starting to think like you just you just went, so now it's my turn. Which yeah. one has haven't I talked about yet? Well, there's two bands that come to mind for me. All you right. see they're, they're gonna be a little Robert Smith action. We're just going to be some GNR. All right. Well, you are correct, sir. <laughs> All right. So I think most everybody who knows me knows that my top favorite bands of all time are The Cure and Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And you can, you can flip that phrasing around all you want, but... And you'd be like, man, what, what the hell is that? Where, where did that come from? Dude, I bought the Cure album at the same day the Pantera album came out. Like, I, like I stood in line, I bought both of those records. The Cure is one of my favorite bands. Well, not my favorite, one of my favorite. Like, yeah, you know, favorite bands, top five records. I probably have in my CD case in the living room in there probably thirty Cure records. Yeah. I mean, I've got all the the, the singles. Um, there, there's actually, I, I helped a guy dig his meter out of the yard the other day, and he gave me a uh, first press record of the head on the door. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, check this out. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. But, uh, yep. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty rad. And so everybody's favorite cure record is different. Yep. Because South Park told him that um, <laughs> disintegration is the best record ever, and, he, and and they were right, especially with it's... Mecca fighting Barbara Streisand sort of uh, <laughs> crap, right? But um, pretty much everything that Cure has ever done is the best record ever, and you you you, you, you know, we we can get into fisticuffs over those that that right. claim. But my favorite Cure record is not Disintegration. It's not The Head on the Door. It's it's actually Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that's probably my favorite too. It and and it's not one of those that everybody would be like, what, what you know, like, oh, you you know it by name, the record. But I. This, this is where I fell in love with The Cure and probably in love with music. In you know, Def Leppard was awesome because I was, you know, right. everybody's pouring sugar on me, but I was, you know, again, 12, 13 years old. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm just some kid in some little town in South Texas, and there's some girl that I actually like, and then the, uh, the, the high school talent show was going on and as as crappy as it sounds think like dirty dancing where it's like everybody's practicing to have flowers in their hair and they're going like or they're like yeah. doing a, a scene from shakespeare they're like right. what light from stupid <laughs> stupid stupid <laughs> i show up all my friends are there lights you know, lights go down, lights come up. 
it's that opening <laughs> scene that opening uh riff from uh just like heaven yep i'd never heard the song before never heard yeah. the song before all the girls stop what they're doing their heads turn it's some high school band that's playing a cover of just like wow. heaven and they are like to this day <laughs> they're the reason why i like the cure because they 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 had it i mean they could have messed up left and right and i would never have known all i knew is that all the girls that i liked were paying attention to those guys on that stage yeah. and i'd never heard that song before but then of course then now i have to find it like the morning after i'm like <laughs> And I found it. My cousin had a record. She had a tape which had that song and a couple others from the record on it. And um, then, then of course, I went down that rabbit hole because yeah. that was to me that was just I was standing in a room, and the song that played was one that we should dance to. I'm <laughs> I'm a stupid little kid. But in my head, like this is this is all like high minded stuff. Like you and I should be dancing to this. And so then, ever ever since then, if if there's a song that matters, yeah, and it's on, then I'm we sh we should be talking about we this. Be dancing. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, Disintegration, The Cure is one of my favorite, like, uh, it's my favorite band of pretty much all time. Again, I've got like, you know, however many records, I've got so many. But man, did that one song, did that have that moment of, yep. Yeah, I was, I was playing that song in bars back when it came out. I mean, it was, it was just one of those songs, but. I was listening to the, to the Cure way before that. Matter of fact, back to about 89, 90 or so, I guess. Maybe before that, because, you know, Love Cats, Boys Don't Cry. Uh, a guy that lived with, well, one of my good friends uh, was a big fan of all that, all that, you know, I guess you would call it alternative of the time, right? So Depeche Mode, Echo and the Bunny Man, The Cure. So I was I was already exposed and listening to a lot of this stuff. You know, NXS was even kind of one of those bands for a while. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they just went, pew, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I've always loved all that stuff. And The Cure was definitely one of those that was so original i mean nobody sounds like robert smith <laughs> mm -mm. well it's weird is because when i was learning how to play the guitar like again <laughs> we'll talk about slash in a minute but yeah. man when i was like playing guitar you know don't cry or you know appetite for you know like all of it i think hit a cure song and it's like oh okay it's one chord and then it's a second chord and it's back or it's four chords or 12 or whatever. But I could sing it. I could sing it and play it at the same time. And I yeah, could also cool. emulate because he's got a pretty thick accent. So it's yeah. like, it's like, it, it's not like somebody who's singing a song where you're like, okay, well, I've got a high up to, to match it. You know, you listen to Robert Smith and you're like, hello. And you, 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 but if you can sing that then it yeah. sounds authentic yeah i mean he, he he might be a fan of the podcast he'd be like yeah you fuck you <laughs> like, yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> hey man <laughs> you're, you're, i'm one of your biggest fans man it's so okay. i mean you know it's it's that thing of his voice about to crack at any second is what made it get have that personality you know because mm -hmm. he was he was giving you that teenage heart. You know, like you said, the song plays and you look at the girl like, 
if I was man enough, we would be dancing to this right now. Yep. But I'm a little scared to even say anything to you, right? That's what he played off of, right? It's that gothic, you know. And he, he did it so well. Yeah. Like again, yeah. like he said, you know, the girl, the girl. There, there, there comes a point where you actually have the balls to to be like, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> But no, you know, like where all these sort of dreams come true and he wrote about them and it's, it's awesome. So, but yeah, that's, that's, that's where my musical, dude, I've got, I'm not making excuses for The Cure because again, like you want to sit there and listen to The Cure all night? I'm there. I, I'm your Huckleberry. But uh, <laughs> man, I got so many different, like, reams and realms and different places where music goes but at the end of it circle it back around to the cure and the cure just drops me at home that's that's where i am that's that's my favorite stuff yeah so what's your next one all right i'm gonna throw in we we, we've kind of talked about Guys with makeup. In some <laughs> occasions here, we've talked about Bob Ezrin. I have to go with Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare. Uh, another concept album. Slash's favorite album of all time. Uh, it's, it's unlike... Well, that was the first album that made me realize how, how you can use theatrics not necessarily visual, but, you know, think of how popular Thriller is and how mm-hmm. iconic the Vincent Price piece is that's in there. Well, Vincent Price is on Welcome to My Nightmare, doing a thing for Black Widow. And so, I mean, it's like Michael Jackson's famous for it, but Alice kind of did it first, you know. Um, Bob Ezrin, again, producing. Bob Ezrin produced all of Alice Cooper's stuff. That's where he started. He started when when Alice Cooper first started, and he produced them all through. Well, not long. Well, I think Welcome to My Nightmare is kind of where he stopped. Production's incredible. This is when Alice has actually left the band, because Alice Cooper was a band, mm-hmm. you know. And then everybody just assumed that he was Alice. Well, the band fell apart, and he just continued on and just used the name as Alice Cooper, and. That album, man, I just it blows me away. It, it's it's a roller coaster ride. It's the same reason that we like Big Trouble in Little China or some of the horror movies that have that dark comedy thing about it, right? Because some songs are fun. I mean, he's singing Cold Ethel. He's singing about making love to a dead woman he keeps in his refrigerator, and it's funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's disturbing, but it's funny. You know. And then you get the songs where Steven, right? Where he's wake up middle of the night and, you know, he's, he's, he's got these issues. His, his parents are, are dead or you don't know if he's killed. I mean, it's, it's got some whacked out stuff on it. And it. But then you got Department of Youth. You've got Welcome to My Nightmare on there. Black Widow, Devil's Food. Uh, Only Women Bleed, you know, <laughs> which, you know, is about spousal abuse. You know, that's what it's about. And it's just, it's an unbelievable album. And, you know, the people that are Cooper fans, they, they know exactly how big of an album it is. But I don't know. It, 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 it really made me appreciate the artistry of audio. You know, same, same thing that I get when I hear The Wall. But this was many years earlier and a little more over the spectrum, right? He's actually mm-hmm. trying to scare you at some point. Then he's trying to pull the make pull the face off and go, look, look, don't be that scared. I'm still just this guy. You know. And that's the brilliance of it. He's bringing up, you know, Marilyn Manson earlier. Marilyn Manson was trying to be Alice Cooper. I don't care what anybody says, that's what he was trying to do. Yep. I'm not dissing him. I mean, I, there's a couple of Manson songs I think are all right, but he's not doing anything new. It's it's Alice Cooper. 
<laughs> no, that that's the thing. It was and <laughs> like we're not we're we're, we're not going to we're not going to cap an Alice Cooper right. conversation yeah. with Marilyn Manson. Right. But but uh, briefly, nah, dude, Manson Marilyn Manson he had a shtick. Sure. And yeah. it it landed it landed whenever he had young and impressionable fans. Sure. Yeah. It was it was time for another one of those shock rockers because they hadn't had one in a while. But and but it just the, happened to work. But the the problem was that that he was he 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 was he was a magician that did like bloody tricks. Yeah. But he didn't let you behind the scenes to see how the tricks were done all he did was be like yeah and, and so that let a lot of people down and or well, <laughs> it, he, he tried to live the character off stage too and yeah that's what hurt him whereas that's where the brilliance of alice and even kiss they had it figured out you leave that on the stage yeah and live your normal life you know it's just like acting when you're on yeah. stage, you're this, and when you walk away, you're a different person. I mean, even Freddie Mercury said, "I'm not that person that you see on stage. When I'm off stage, I'm a human being." You know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think, think that... he, he tried to he tried to carry it too far, and and it well, works I, for selling for a little bit, but look what it's costed now, right? I, I think that's uh, I think that's Cobain that did that, where it's like this sure. is this is just me. Yeah, yeah. Like e even if you like, even the Beatles, they're like, "Hey, we're playing a song, but eventually we have to sleep." Right. So we're just, we just, yeah, we're close behind closed doors. We're just who we are. The dudes, right? And uh, but yeah, like I think I think that changed in the '90s, but you know, yeah. yeah. Well, your expectations were different then, right? Because now MTV is a mainstay, so you are fabricated to be something that is sellable visually and you can kind of get trapped in that right you know when your goal is i mean kiss didn't grow up with the goal of being a band that you saw on mtv because there was no mtv mm -hmm. the age groups after that their goal was to get on mtv which is a total different perspective than being a an arena band you know can, and i think that can you imagine how much it would suck to be a really, really good band that MTV was like, no, because we're going to put on Pregnant Housewives? Happens all the time, right? <laughs> and now, now the only way you're going to see a video of a band is to go on YouTube. You yeah. And it's a shame. It's, it's bad. Yeah. How many great bands have we probably missed on because there's no market for it anymore? There's, there's a lot of them. Yeah. So, All right. Appetite for Destruction <laughs> is the, the the quintessential record of records yeah. to me. Like that, that made me wake up and stop being a kid. That continually makes me a kid again. That's yeah. the record that i continually am playing guitar on like learning little solo pieces and trying to it's like i don't know man like i've i've read it's in my bookshelf over there i've read slash's biography and he's just like ah, oh, I, I barely remember any of this but all of all of the uh the solos that are on appetite for destruction are I mean, I, I don't really know how you could do that and not mean it. Like I, I, I understand that you you can do it do it accidentally and kind of stumble upon it and, and have it be recorded, but I, I don't understand how you could possibly do it unintentionally because they're so sure. good. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, it's it came out when I was 17 years old. It it changed rock and roll. I mean, I don't know what else you can say about it. It's every every song is a classic. I mean, 
you know, every little bit of it is there's the only there's, song nowadays that I don't want to hear is Paradise City. Uh, that one's kind of wore out its weapon for me. It, it's worn <laughs> out, but that doesn't make it not good. Oh, yeah, yeah like, I'm that, not saying that's, it's not good. like, yeah, I, I, I saw a meme the other day. It was like Guns N' Roses parameters, it's like grass, normal color. <laughs> like, <laughs> Girls are attractive and grass is the normal color. That's paradise. Right. <laughs> like, okay, well, we've been for the last like 35 years. We're like, oh, I want to go to the paradise city <laughs> where grass is green and girls are pretty. Girls are pretty, yeah. <laughs> but I've been like, you know, we <laughs> at the beginning of this show, <laughs> like, a year ago like oh you know like <laughs> i've uh i've been playing guitar again and trying to go back and learn all that stuff it was weird being in a cover band where every week you had to learn a new song and i'm not i'm not making excuses for my failures for for that but you're you're not sitting there being like oh yeah. it's 12 13 10 12 13 9 12 13 11 you're like, okay, it's, you know, yeah. chords and fills. You learn, them well, you learn them well enough to play them live that you don't get into the details of the actual songs because well, you're doing it to be able to perform it live <laughs> right. and get through it. <laughs> well, I was never playing the solos. I was yeah. just playing the rhythms. And right. so, like, now I'm like, okay, well, oh, shit, that's hard. Yeah. This is probably where I need to stop and sit <laughs> down and play that over and over and over again, because right. that's right there. That's the difference between good guitar players and people like me who want to be good guitar players yep. and yep. aren't. So that's what I've been doing. And, yep. you know, it's been working out. It's good. But, man, talking about elementary school talking about junior high i remember the, you you said you were 17 mm-hmm. yeah you're five yeah. years older than me so i was 12 yeah <laughs> the same year white lions pride winger came out guns and roses all were right there close to that same period uh the cult electric was the same year so yeah i mean it was <laughs> i was high stepping man that was my music <laughs> I I remember showing up for art class. I, I'm just some dork. I probably have a, like a half mullet <laughs> just because my mom didn't move the bowl right or something. Like <laughs> I, I remember just being, just, dude. I was just a little kid surrounded by all these girls. All of a sudden, like and. I remember this girl was like, hey, because I, I had a whole bunch of eyes that I had drawn. I'd come out of art class and they were like, hey, draw eyes. So I had like half lidded eyes with eyelashes and I had surprised ones. It was not a very big thing, but it was a thing. Like, yeah. And she's like, oh, you can draw. Can you draw this? And she slapped down the tape cover yeah. of Appetite. Yeah. With the bullet and the two guns and everything. And I looked at it and as <laughs> kind of as a contractor, I was like, I can draw this, but it's going to take me a while. I was like, what is this? She's like, you don't know what this is. And she, so she pushed the tape across my desk and she goes, okay, go home and listen to this. I don't, I don't even remember like, this girl was not, we were in the same class in like eighth grade or something. <laughs> she, it wasn't like she was some hot chick that I'm like trying to impress. There's some girl from across the desk. She goes, hey, here's the, here's the seed, here's the tape. Go home and make a copy and then bring me back a drawn picture of this on Monday. <laughs> like, okay. Went home, put it in my Walkman. Life yeah. has never been the same. Yeah. 
probably showed up like obviously I taped it so I had to give it back. I was like, yeah, I couldn't draw that because <laughs> my life's going a different way because instead of drawing things, I'm gonna learn how to play the guitar now. <laughs> my my best friend that was also my classmate through most of the years, Matt Parham, was always about a week or so ahead of me on music. Dude, you got to hear White Lion. This guitar player is incredible, which Vito Brada is. He's amazing. Dude, that Winger album's really good. You know, same deal. Then he's, the Guns are, he's like, man, he said, this Guns N' Roses album is just phenomenal. And at that point, I had only heard Welcome to the Jungle. I'd seen the video for it. So he went and bought the, the CD or the cassette and was telling me how great it was. And it wasn't long after that is when they actually showed them playing live at the Ritz on MTV. And yeah, that just did it. I mean, I saw that. Then I heard the cassette and I was like, man, I mean, <laughs> this is phenomenal. And I, and I did like Lies. I, I mean, I really enjoyed the stuff on Lies, even though it's got its issues nowadays too. <laughs> some, some words he said. <laughs> but I never cared for anything else they did. I just, it's, I don't know if I credit up to too big, too fast, but I didn't care for anything off of either one of the Use Your Illusions albums. I just, it's appetite for me and lies. And then from there, I'm, I'm kind of checked out. I'm not going to argue with you, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm the same way, but not. Like it's yeah. one of those like, so uh, as 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 strange and weird as it sounds, so a friend of mine and I had a, a an awesome debate about Alice in Chains, mm. and his favorite record was Facelift, which is. Sure. one of my yeah, favorite the first yeah but then, then we talk about the the stuff that came after uh jar of flies and i'm like no you know my favorites are sap and jar of flies yeah and and dirt you know like but alice in chains was kind of always their best in that mid-tempo slowness Right. That's where that's where they really punch because they were really good. They were good, heavy. Yeah. But they were also kind of forgettable in that in that zone. They were they were awesome in that mid tempo. So was so was GNR. That was the thing. And so like out of all of the records all out, out of all of the songs off of those two records november rain was great don't cry was great. like all of their hits off of those couple of records was right in their zone and they weren't they weren't like punk rock and say that's the thing it's it's not mr brownstone you know that that's that's what i wanted it's, well that they should have done that yeah they should have but the thing was, was they, they, they followed up Mr. Brownstone with Patience, which was a great song. Yeah. And then they kind of just stayed there. Right. Yep. And, yeah. And that's, it, that's what I mean. It's, it's, that, it's that thing that happened because that, that rawness and that punk attitude to me is what made that first album. And I, and I really have a problem when, all right, now Guns N' Roses has three extra people in the band it's like what are yeah. we leonard skinner now i mean <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm right, dude i'm right there with you yeah like all you this said. stuff just it's almost to me it's almost like they, they got too big too fast and then axel just kind of got a little too full of himself and oh, that's that's the story of gnr sure sure and that's, axel... that's the same problem i got was same problem i got with sting from the police right <laughs> dude you came from the police you wouldn't have a career if it weren't for the police, you know. <laughs> and the police are better than you. That's the, that's that's the thing about GNR is that GNR is better. Like Izzy Stradlin and Slash should have continued playing together. Steven Adler, man, you should. I mean, like the the entire London setup. Should, like, I I I I 
I saw something the other day and you see on, on Instagram or whatever, where they show like, like it, it, it was a picture of Axel shoes. Like it was, it was his Jordans that had Axel printed on them, which he probably paid like $500 <laughs> in the nineties for him, which is like $300,000 now. Right. I'm like, dude, if you could have just like being you now, knowing how shitty the world actually is, could you just go back in time and enjoy being huge in the 90s instead of being such a jerk? Because really, that's what he did. Sure. It's like, oh, I'm so good. I'm just going to be an ass. Well, yeah. hey, guess what? Everybody just... Yeah. <laughs> it's a the same reason i'm not an aretha franklin fan right i mean right. yeah yeah you can sing but you're too hard to get along with i mean right. you know? so so i don't but know it doesn't take anything away from that first album that first album is was such a game changer it changed rock and roll period i mean i, I don't know how you can argue it any differently it changed rock and roll i i think that it brought rock and roll back to where it kind of did was supposed to be yeah and yeah. and it's strange how ever since rock and roll's been trying to find it again yeah that's true um it's it's weird i don't know um this episode ran long <laughs> what's your last uh i you, I'd... I think that's pretty much it for me. I mean, I can name a ton of honorable mentions. Uh, loudness, Lightning Strikes, Japanese Band. Uh, I learned a lot of drums off that. Triumph, Allied Forces. What a great album. I'm a huge Triumph fan. Uh, <laughs> big time underrated band. Uh, YNT, uh, what was the name of the album? Contagious. Uh, I just love every song on it. The trick or treat soundtrack. <laughs> I mean, I can't. I mean, we bring it up all the time. It's one of my favorite things to listen to, hands down. I just love it. Uh, Zeppelin II. Uh, I mean, I just go down list the, the first Bullet Boys album, the uh, Killer Dwarfs Big Deal, Operation Mind Crime by Queens I mean, I. I <laughs> Dude, you know? I was gonna say like I said at the beginning because it never it never came up, but I was like, dude, I think one of the most influential records on my like everything was uh, we sort of surf for rock and roll by Black Sabbath. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've already closed the episode down, but we're still recording. My <laughs> my my dad said that he was in the DJ booth one night and. You know, somebody called him on the phone and was like, hey, I got something awesome. He's like, okay. He's like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. You know, like, I got a new record. You need to hear. He's like, Somebody knocked on the studio door. My dad went down and, like, brought the guy up. He's like, oh, this is a new record out of England that nobody's ever heard before. And he's like, okay, well, I can't play it because of FCC, so I'll track it on the you know like so he's got he's got his forward playing music and dad said he said sat there and listened to black sabbath being like this is the greatest record i've ever heard yeah. How, like he's like where did you get this he's like i just got off a plane from london like wow. this is the big thing going on over there he's like okay well then we're gonna be first so he like flipped the record and was like Hey guys, this is the newest thing out of England. Boom. <laughs> Play track that first Black Sabbath record. So like my man, my whole entire thing has been like Ozzy Osbourne. You could be like, oh hey. Sure. Yeah. Um Black Sabbath in you know 83. I'm like, I don't know, man. I I can certainly tell you about the wizard. Yeah, absolutely. Fairies were boost, man. Dude, I've been working on learning how to play that song. <laughs> it cracks me up all the time because he's like, he's like, oh, there's all the music. 
He's like, fairies wear boots, man. And <laughs> nobody cares. Nobody cares. Right. You gotta believe me. No, nobody. He's like, dude, tripping and smoking is all that you do. Take these drugs. And go. <laughs> like nobody cares it's an it's like a eight minute song it was like yeah hey yeah. ferris with boots nah. yeah <laughs> so good absolutely all right let's close this one down